Do you believe in mind over matter? Do you tend to believe that you can do anything you want as long as you put your mind to it? It's a question of intelligence and willpower. Uh, do you like feeling in full control of everything that you do, everything that you try to learn? Uh, well, if you are that kind of person, then very likely uh, this whole comprehensible input thing is going to be a little bit difficult to accept. That's generally been my observation. I don't know what you think. Um, because, for sure, there are some who try to have their cake and eat it, and they try to study all the words up front before they get the comprehensible input, such that they feel like they understand what every single word is doing in the input that they receive. But the original claim of comprehensible input is that if you understand what's going on, then your brain automatically puts the pieces of the language together, such that it's much more like a bodily function than something that we achieve uh, through brain power and willpower. In the same way as you can't fully control your digestive system or your heart rate, you, can, you, you can't control the language acquisition process either. That's what it amounts to. Uh, but language is such a fundamental part of our intellect, it seems, our conscious experience, that it can be um, a bitter pill to swallow for some. But, well, if that turns out to be reality, uh, then we're not doing ourselves any favours as language learners if we avoid it, are we? So that's really the point of what we're doing here. So Opili Netoki Pona uh, is a short series, 20 minutes a day for a month is enough to finish the series. And by the end of it, uh, hopefully you should witness for yourself how your brain uh, puts the pieces of the language together without you realizing it. Uh, so in these interviews, I'm interviewing individuals who have gone through all the videos uh, to see what they think and um, hopefully have a conversation in Tokipona. And um, well, no matter what the explanation turns out to be, if your brain really is doing all the hard work in the background, then... Maybe we're better off if we just let it do its thing as a language learner instead of trying to force it. But yeah, as we do these interviews, of course, I like to uh, get the perspectives of those who have been through the videos because everybody has a different experience as a language learner. Uh, so uh, I'd like to welcome Raymond. How are you keeping? Hey. Thanks. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for joining. Thanks for joining us. So um, before we talk about the experiment. Uh, let's get to know you a little bit more uh, with respect to language. What would you say your background with language is and language learning? Um, so honestly, I was kind of in a very isolated um, English-centric household growing up. So I was not exposed to really any other languages for a long time until basically I was forced to learn another language in high school. Um, and I wasn't that interested in it, so I didn't put that much effort into it for a long time. But eventually, you know, you know, I got passing grades, and I, I learned some Spanish, but most of that faded, and I hardly know any of it today. Um, mm -hmm. so I don't really have much of a background in language learning at all, honestly. It's just something that, um, maybe I have a renewed interest in, or something that I've always kind of had on the back burner, like, oh, maybe this could be interesting, but it's such a daunting task that I never really got to step my foot into that progress at all uh, until, of course, I saw Toki Pona and I, I saw a, a light at the end of the tunnel with something a little bit more digestible, I guess. Oh, cool. So um, I'm wondering, you know, the things I talked about at the beginning, um, I, I generally get the impression that the school system seems to leave us with that impression because you, you have um, your various classes, you've got uh, you know, history and and biology and mathematics, and we we are and, and then you have your language class, and you're left with the impression that learning a language is like learning the other things. Especially, uh, I was led to think of language as being a, almost like a mathematical system, uh, where you have nouns and verbs and adjectives and so on, and and you build the sentence in a way that you might build an equation. Uh, was that your impression? Um, 
Not really. I think I was lucky to have some actually very good language teachers. So um, it was, it seemed like they were trying to foster that kind of uh, immersion in the language itself. And, you know, once you get past the first year or so, most of the um, time you're spending in that classroom is spoken in that language anyway. So you end up basically in that kind of ALG scenario where you're constantly having these conversations and you're learning in new words, but you see them in context and you start picking them up. So mm. I think I actually was very lucky to have some some good education on that front. That That's good. I, I have heard that a lot of, an, uh, especially in the, in the American school system, in the K-12 system, uh, there's more and more awareness of this kind of thing. Um, I th of course, I'm, I'm out here in Turkey. And um, I, I think when you have a have countries where the school system is is more or less the same as it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, maybe what I just described is maybe more relevant um, in, for other countries. Uh, but I know that there are a lot of teachers in the States, especially they're doing things like TPRS, uh, which uses, you know, which uses comprehensible input, uh, even though there is still the drive to be in full conscious control of the process uh, there is more and more acknowledgement that you know input and you know communicative experience of the language is the way to go mm -hmm. um yeah so that's that's interesting so you got a bit of spanish um and and you did okay uh with that system so um so that's good so but you said still that you know learning a language feels like a daunting task and then tokupana was like uh Light at the end of the tunnel, I think, was the expression you used. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like I, like I had it, is somewhere in my my head somewhere. I was like, well, learning a language would kind of be cool, but it's just not something that I want to put the time into. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, especially something like Japanese, which was like very different. You know, a couple of years ago, I just tried to memorize the alphabet, and just that alone was so so daunting because it's so different. Um, that even when I started to learn it, I felt like I had accomplished basically nothing anyway, and mm. that it, without some more guidance or a particular uh, course or teacher, that I was just kind of lost in the in the mud there. So I kind of gave up on that and I faded away. But yeah, like when I saw Toki Pona, I think I just saw it on like a random YouTube video one day. Okay. Um, it just seemed like it was something that was more digestible but i also really liked the idea of uh, a simple language that hmm. you have to be more creative in your description of things and it's um kind of like this mini problem solving you do in your head all the time which is something i like to do anyway nice so uh you got interested in tokipona as almost like um a a uh, a demo a demo it's like a demo almost so uh if you if you master tokipona if you get used to this process of mastering a language as a solo learner with tokipona then you can scale that up for another language you might want to learn especially japanese as you say is a very um difficult language to master because of the script um and and also it's um it's a verb final language, so the structure is very different to English. It's mm -hmm. perhaps difficult to analyze it in the same way as you might another European language. Um, so when you started to learn Tokipona, you also decided to use these videos to do it. So, well, um, actually, no. I mean, at first, I when I just searched around, I found um, Jan Kekin-san's videos. Right. Um, and I watched all of them, but at the end of that, I, I still didn't feel like I had gained that much. Um, so then I was like, well, I need to learn the words. So I spent a couple of days on Memorize learning all the words. And then the next day I'd forgotten most of them. So I realized that, of course, that's that's not how you learn something effectively, right? And then I was True. searching for something different. And that's when I came upon uh, your video series. But I didn't actually realize when I first started your video series that it was um, set up in that, in that way. I just I saw see. number one. I was like, oh, this is cool. And then every day I just end up watching one after work. And then at the end I realized, oh, well, that's actually what I was supposed to be doing. It's kind of interesting. So mm. it kind of worked out nice for me to have that that schedule. Nice. So of course, um, with respect to the experiment that Opirina Tokipona uh, was designed for, 
-hmm. Of course, the idea is that we take somebody who knows nothing about Tokyopana at all and just watch the videos. Of course, in your case, as you say, it's true that by the end of watching Yan Kekan San's videos and trying to memorize the words, you couldn't really remember anything instantaneously in the moment. But I'm sure that having that background will have had an effect. I mean, I, I still think it's an open question as to just how much that conscious knowledge can influence the process. I think perhaps um, even though that information that you learned before watching the videos wasn't available to you um, online, as they say, such that you could understand and speak Tokipon on the fly, I I'm sure that it will have primed you in some way. You know, you knew what kind of structures to expect and you maybe had at least some familiarity with some of the words such that uh, you wouldn't have um, associated a word with something completely different from what it means. Uh, yeah, I would say, you, that you say that's true. It definitely started to lay some of that foundation for me, um, mm -hmm. especially in the first couple of videos. It didn't feel completely foreign to me because I had heard some of the words before. Um, yeah. So everything kind of made sense right from the beginning for me, which yeah. might not be the experience that other people had. But I think through the rest, it, it kind of maintained that course. It didn't yeah. feel like um, it was a, a huge boost overall. It just seemed like it kind of got me started a little bit easier, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. I I, th I think it does. And the, an analogy I like to use sometimes is of a turbocharger. So the, the conscious knowledge you might have of a language, of course, it, it diminishes the surprise involved and as shannon tells us information is a measure of surprise so to whatever extent the surprise is is less to that extent you already have some knowledge of of the language and still that is a turbocharger at best so if you have a super duper turbocharger on your engine but you don't have any fuel you're not going anywhere and without comprehensible input you're not going to make progress in the language. Sure, the knowledge you have about the language up front might help your brain to interpret things one way rather than the other because you've already eliminated certain possibilities. So that's, it's a turbocharger in that sense. It can make the process go faster. But until you start experiencing the language being used in communication, nothing's going to happen. You can study all you want. Uh, right. Would you agree with that idea? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think eventually if I had continued down a different path and not found your video series that I would have um, maybe still still gotten there eventually, I just think it would be a lot more difficult, a lot more time consuming. But I think mm. if, that if you have enough determination, you can definitely make it happen. Sure. Um, I do think that that extra foundation I had before I started your series was also somewhat of a detriment because I found myself a little bit distracted thinking, oh, wait, do I know what that word means? And then I'd be wrong. And then I'd just be mm. focusing on that instead of focusing on actually just being immersed in, in the story yeah. and what the word meant in that context. And I kind of uh, kept going back and forth with that kind of distraction. So I think it wasn't it wasn't all perfect, right? But it definitely was mm. a little bit of a boost, yeah. It's, it's interesting that because, um, you know, the ALG approach does say that the interference of the conscious mind uh, is a problem. So there's a, something that uh, J. Marvin Brown uh, liked to say, which is that uh, children and adults can do it right, but only adults can do it wrong. <laughs> and yeah. uh, keeping that, you know, conscious monitor, uh, that, that conscious anal an analyzing of the language, you know, turning that off is also... A, a skill in a way so <laughs> it's it's something you have to get used to doing turning that off and focusing on what's going on and what the point of the conversation is that's actually what needs to happen it's the vital ingredient and not everybody is up for that uh, apart from anything else and even if you are it can be a struggle uh, because you're forcing yourself to focus on one thing rather than than what you would perhaps naturally focus on um so that, that seems to chime with what you're saying. Yeah, and I'm a 
fairly an analytical person overall. So that's it's definitely something that was uh, I, I could feel that struggle happening in my own mind, but I wasn't sure how to to, to yeah. quell it um, other than to just focus on the story as best as I could uh, and maybe try to not look at the screen sometimes and see if I could follow along still. But that itself is sometimes a distraction too, because I was trying to overachieve my my own goals there and then it wasn't maybe learning as much. So I don't know, there's a lot to to how um not just how the series works, but how to best watch it as a learner too, I think mm. is is something that's an interesting discussion to have. Yes, I agree. I agree. I agree. And um that's also why I think it's it's useful to have a little demo like this, like a mini language, a mini course, just such that, you know, you can just try it. Just try to switch your brain off. <laughs> just try it. You know, uh, if if um, you're one of these people who feels like they need to be in control of everything, well, what what have you got to lose, really, with with Opilinet Occupana? Just, just try it. If you get to the end of thirty days, twenty minutes a day, and and nothing happened, then what did you lose? Nothing. But if you give it a try and you realize that actually, yes, yeah, something is going on in the background, then it can give you what you need to just let go a little bit with the next language you learn. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, to play devil's advocate, I'm sure someone might say, well, that's a lot of time that I don't want to invest right now. <laughs> but uh, I think that it's definitely, I agree that it is worth a shot. And even if um, it seems difficult. Um, once you start getting into a couple of episodes, you can almost feel it happening because you start to pick up on uh, certain phrases and you recognize them almost immediately already. So I think it's something that can happen and you can start to feel the effects pretty quickly. So it might not even take you know all the 30 days for you to start to, to see what, what it's happening and how it's happening in your own mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks for your thoughts. Um, with respect to the experiment, we've kind of answered the question. So, did you know any Tokyopana beforehand? As you said, Jan Kekansan's videos, and also you did um, go through the vocabulary, I think, tried to memorize it. Um, so, during the experiment, uh, you were watching one a day, every day, for 30 days, I think. Did, maybe you missed a couple of days, I don't know. Or, or, or did you stick to the schedule pretty much? No, I mean, I was pretty rigid about the schedule because every day after work, it was just like the thing I would do to wind down after work. Um, and then on the weekends, it's just some random time during the day. But it, it seemed to fit my schedule nicely. So I think I was exactly 30 for 30. Yeah. Well, if, if watching the videos was something you, you do to wind down, that that makes me happy as well. Because <laughs> I wanted to make them enjoyable to watch. So um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, good. that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So uh, let let's give it a go. Let's have a have a conversation in Tokyo Pona. Sina ken Tokyo. All right. Let's try it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yan ante. Sina toki in sieni yan ante seme. Uh, sina sona ala e yan ante. Taso, yan ante toki ni. Sole ni. Ni, soli ni. Soli ka kalama. Soli kalama. Arr, 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 arr. Soli kalama ala. Ala. Sanseme. Sina kalama. Sina? Ala, ala. Sina kalama. Nimi mi li tawa sina e ni. Soli pi olen mute. Bona, bona. Sina kepeken nimi ante. Eh, mi, mi, mi kepeken nimi ni. So eli kalama. Eh, so eli pinasin ni la. Mi toki ni ni li so eli kalama. Taso ni li tan pilin mi. Sina la sina yo e so eli kalama. Lon tomo sina. Sina oline so eli ni. So eli ni li kalama ala. Li kalama mute ala. Ni la sina pilin ala e ni. Ah, nimi uh, ni li pona soweli kalama. E sina la, e nimi ni li pona ala tawa soweli ni. Mi, mi sona e pilin sina nuseme. Pona, yeah. 
E po ne. Um, mi se ona e, soveli kalama uh, ike. Uh, <laughs> nime um, nime li ike uh, e, e yaki. E, soveli olin mute um, Uh, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> Sorry. Ni li ki ala. Ni, si sina to ki pona. So we li li ni mi pona. Tawami. Yeah, so Li ken kepe ken nimi ni, tawa soweli piante lili, e, sina sona, e, soweli ni e, li awen lon tomo yan, e, taso soweli ni li yo e, e linia suli lonuta. Sina sona la sona e soweli ni? Uh, mi sona... Uh... Pona, taso soli pi olen mute uh, li nimi mi pona mute uh, taso nimi ante li pona. Pona, nimi can, nimi mute li can. Nimi wan, li don ala lon toki pona. Nimi mute li lo. Bona. E, mila soveli olin li ken soveli kalama e, pi nasin pi soveli sina anu li ken e, soveli pi linia uta. E, taso soveli pi olin mute li soveli sina. Tani, soveli ni li olin mute e sina. <laughs> e sina... <laughs> soveli ante, soveli pi linia uta, li olin ala e sina, lo nasin sama. Sina kama tawa tomola, soveli sina, li pilin pona a. Ah, yan, yan, uh, yan, 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 wem, yan wemon li kama, ah, Yan women li kama mi filin pona a so we li pilin ya uta li lookin tawa sina ah sina kama ah ni li ken nila so we li sina la so we li piolin mute li ken ni mi pona so we li pilin ya uta li ken oli nesina ta so nasin oli ni li ante sina lonala la so we ni li pilin ni ke a Taso sina kama tawa tomo la, eh, soweli ni li nasa ala. Ha, a ah, mi, mi, mi lukin eh, ni mi pona. Eh, soweli sina, ni mi pi soweli sina li ken soweli pi olin nasa. <laughs> <laughs> sina pili neseme. Uh, anu soweli pi olin ale. Pona, pona nilika, nilika. So that was that was fun. What did we just talk about? Uh, well, um, I want to try at the beginning to be a little bit more um, playful because I think a lot of when you're studying languages uh, can be rigid. So I was trying to poke fun at the fact that you called them uh, noisy animals. You called dogs. <laughs> um, yes. But. Uh, I think that's kind of not a great name, so I prefer to call them um, dogs or animals that um, have a lot of love. Yeah. Uh, because that's um, I, what I think sets them apart, uh, especially for humans, is the fact that they're so loving to, to humans. Uh, so that's yeah. what I wanted to call them. Uh, but like you responded, there's, of course, a million ways to call anything in Tokipono, which is kind of the point. Um, but I especially like the contrast that you went in with, with I believe you're talking about cats where they're just like, Oh, yeah, you're 
you're home, whatever, it's fine. Whereas a yeah. dog is going right. to really love that you're home and be excited about it. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it's good. It's good. That, that's 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 a solid um, um, intermediate level conversation, I think. Okay, yeah, I, I was mean... a little bit worried how much I'd be able to. <laughs> <laughs> it, no, it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Pretty good. It, it's it's interesting how um when you've got the um I don't know what to say ethos maybe of Tokipona, uh you can get into very deep conversations very quickly once you've got the hang of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, it's it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. Uh, thanks for that. So um yeah, I I, I think it's uh, interesting to look into and, and to think about all the different ways you can call things in Tokipona. It's not that we're looking for the one perfect term for th something. The point is that I want you to know what I'm talking about in the moment. So in the context of the videos, yeah, I call dogs noisy animals <laughs> just because, you know, they, they, they make more noise than a cat, right? So you, you kind of got what I meant when I was in the videos, you knew I was talking about dogs. And, and that's really how we communicate in Tokipona. I just keep giving you details using the vocabulary of Tokipona until I'm sure that you know what I'm talking about. And then it's not that, oh, well, I've, I've found the perfect, this is the term for this thing. Um, you can call it something else when we talk about it again. It's no problem. And I think right. it's, and it's interesting in how uh, that really does treat language as a tool rather than a representation or a picture of, of the world, because it's not a question of giving everything the one true name. It's using language as a tool, as a game, to pick out a concept that's in your mind. So we're separating concepts from the words we use to talk about them. I, I find that fascinating as a philosophical question. I don't know about you. Right. Yeah. And I think like you were kind of alluding to that it's not the word I would always use in different contexts. I might call it something else uh, because it's more useful to that audience at that time. There you go. Um, and I think another uh, kind of along those lines is that I think Toki Pony makes it, it even more important that you're being an active listener, because if you have an audience that you're not sure is listening, that you might not really know if they do know what you're talking about. Right. Especially if you're, um, if you don't have an audience, maybe you're writing a book or you're writing something down, then you have to be very diligent that you know that your audience is going to understand you. Uh, and you can't just make these shortcuts because uh, you have no idea, right? You just are going to hope that they understand you and you have to give enough details and context for them to get there. Whereas when you're having a conversation in in um, in real life or orally, then you can really um, gauge that based on the person's active listening to understand oh, this person's kind of on the same page, or maybe they're not. I agree. I think that um, my background as a translator maybe helps me out a bit because, uh, you know, what I do every day is anticipate how the other person will react to what I'm writing. So it's not enough for me as a translator to just say, well, you know, I've translated it correctly according to the dictionary. Uh, or the, the the structure in English has been faithfully represented in, in Turkish and the target language. Grammatically, these two sentences are equivalent. That's not good enough. I need to actually think about how easy it will be for the reader to pass what I've written. And I need to be open to maybe gremlins or misunderstandings, potential misunderstandings. You know, if, if you say it like that in Turkish, where does somebody's mind naturally go? There is no algorithm. There is no set of rules that will tell you uh, how to do that. You just have to go at it on a case-by-case -case basis. You, you write your translation, and then you say, well, forget the English, read the Turkish. Okay, if I were to read this as a Turkish reader, what would I get from it? And if it's not what I want, then I have to change the Turkish, no matter how um, analytically I or, or correctly, in inverted commas, I've done that translation. So I think that set me in good stead for Tokipona, 
but it is a challenge. I think it is a challenge. And is 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 your goal when you write in Tokipona to express yourself or is it to communicate? I think that's the question you have to ask yourself. Yeah, and along those lines, I once I finished her series, I couldn't find anything similar. So um, I joined the Discord, and I, I found actually a lot of music that people had written to a point that I thought was good. So I ended up listening to a lot of different creators and what kind of music they've come up with in Tokipona. And that's exactly that, right? That's creative expression. That's not, it's not important, as important to a, a creator writing a song that is understood. It's no. more important that they're being creatively expressive, which yes. uh, in turn, as someone listening, makes it, I think, a lot more difficult to actually <laughs> understand what they're what they're trying to get at sometimes, uh, especially if you're new to the to Toki Pona, it felt like, well, I kind of get the vibe, but there's some of these sentences, you know, are are a little more poetic and I can't really quite grasp them as well as I could a concrete sentence, but maybe that's the point anyway. So uh it, it was a it was a different path um uh, yes. to to yes. music like that. Yes. Yes, yes, you're you're quite right. You're quite right. When I was starting out with Toki Pona, I would get frustrated sometimes by that because yeah. I would kind of be hard on myself and say, well, if I was really good at in Toki Pona, I should be able to understand this. Sometimes actually, no, you can be as good as you like in Toki Pona. If the writer is hasn't really valued being understood on the first read and they're just trying to express themselves then no it's not reasonable to expect yourself to understand what's been written on the first go because that's not the point of the material so you you can't measure yourself by these things take something where somebody is actually trying to make a point in Tokipona like Lipu Tenpo like um, Lipu Kule you know, read that because something where somebody's actually trying to communicate with you, that is a is is a better way to gauge yourself, because the point of that is is actual communication, you know. But like you said, don't don't you know read the strong lyric once without reading the English translation and say, well, let's test myself, let's try and see if I can understand what this song is about without looking at the English. This is not a reasonable test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It, so, it felt kind of that way where it was like, well, I, I, some of the sentences were just completely, just seemed foreign, right? <laughs> because yes. they were, they were creative, but also there's a lot of, um, words that are outside of the original, um, they call it poo, right? Uh, that have become more common in the Discord, I guess, or in the Tokipona community that end up in, in songs. And so they're just words that are completely foreign. Uh, another problem with music is that, it tends to be a, probably a little bit faster than speech. So things like utala and utala end up sounding the same. And for someone who's learning, you're just not sure which one it was. And you, and without knowing that, the whole sentence is kind of thrown out the window because you weren't you weren't sure what's going on at all. Um, so it, it definitely was a lot more challenging uh, trying to, to use music to learn. But I found it more fun, so I'm still trying. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Just so, so, long, so long as you don't um, see it as a test all the time. And then you right. can just enjoy the process and it'll happen. Yeah. yeah. So uh, before we wrap up, there's uh, two things I like to ask everybody who comes on the podcast, on the show, as it were. Um, has doing this challenge changed anything for you? Um. Yeah, I think I was, like I said, kind of at the beginning, I was on kind of a, a different trajectory where I wasn't really sure how I was going to best um learn the vocabulary because I, I realized that memorizing it was not the right way but i i was seeking something different so uh, when i found the series it definitely seemed like a better path to get started so it, it definitely changed the the path i went down significantly um and it, it almost reminded me well you know i haven't been to school in a while but when i was learning in school if I wanted to pass a test, of course, I could cram all the, the words in the night before, but that's not actually how you learn something that you want to retain. Um, and that's a different process. So it was kind of a, a good reminder to to step back and say, well, maybe I should take a look at how I'm actually learning this and, and try to go about it a different way. Cool. So do you feel more confident about, say, Japanese or any other language that you might want to learn in the future? Um, Maybe slightly. Uh, I still think that it's 
while ALG seems like a, a great idea, it's still something that you have to step into and you have to find that that right place to even be immersed in that content anyway. Um, and maybe those those content creators exist and you can find a lot of what you need, but when you're learning a, a language in another country and you're surrounded forcibly um, in that context of ALG, then it, I think it's more natural. So if, of course, if I went to Japan for several months, I think that uh, I would be more optimistic, but without doing that, I, I'm not sure that it's, um, I'm much more optimistic about the process, but definitely a little bit. Yeah, okay. Well, um, for what it's worth, um, as you know, Discord is a great place. Uh, there are a lot of good servers and um, that there are, well, ALG enthusiasts, practitioners, I don't know how you would call it, uh, that there are such uh, servers uh, where they're exchanging ideas and, and such for how to make it work, even when you're not in the country. Right. Um, so, yeah, look into that if you like. Uh, I just think I think it might 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 just, um, you know, open a couple of doors for you. It's just an idea, you know, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. So uh, something I also like to ask is about the course itself. I mean, obviously, you know, I, I'm learning and it was a learning experience for me. Um, if I were to do the course again or if somebody else wants to make content like what I've made, uh, would you have any suggestions or recommendations for them? Any, you know, constructive criticism? Um, maybe I'm biased, but I definitely like animals. So I was really interested in the, the all different sorts of animal stories that we had uh, in the beginning. And then when we had more of the historical stories, I, I lost a little bit more interest because that's personally not what I'm as interested in. But I think it was nice to have that kind of variety. Um, but I think the historical ones also were just a lot harder to follow. Whereas when you had the animal stories or even when you had the story about your own experience, I think that was a lot easier to um, to follow along what was happening. Whereas when you had to tell some of the historical stories, some of the terms you had to come up with and describe and use um, were already a little bit hard. So it made the rest of it a little bit harder. Uh, right. But there wasn't too many of those. And I think that was it was still an interesting challenge to, to take those um, stories and, and run with them anyway. Um, but I may be moving, moving them to like the very last, I know you did them toward the end, but maybe having them like as the absolute last would have been a better idea too. But otherwise I think, no, it was great. You did a great job. No, thanks. Okay. So that's interesting because a lot of the feedback I've got, some people have given me almost the opposite feedback, Really? That, you know, <laughs> the, the, the stories and Aesop's fables, you know, uh, um you know something real something that actually happened <laughs> oh. um so some but i i think your criticism of the um let's say real events stories is not that they were real events but that they were difficult to follow in some places because of the terminology and such so that's 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 fair enough um i i got a lot of good feedback about the walkman story for example um, I think that might have been one of the easier ones to follow, if you if you remember. Yeah, I think that one was was easier to follow. I think the one that really stands out to me that was hard to follow was the um, Madame Curie. Right. One. Okay. Um, just because radiation itself is hard to explain in any language, <laughs> so trying to do it in Tokyo <laughs> was, was hard true. True. Okay. That's interesting. That's interesting. I I think um as a creator as a content creator. Um, variety is important. You know, different strokes for different folks, as they say. And the other thing is that at a beginner level, you need to keep it, you need to keep it real. Ha <laughs> ha. No, <laughs> realia, I mean. So uh, stuff that you can actually see, talking about things that you can see is important when you're relying on visual cues to make something comprehensible. Right. So talking about abstract entities is a really bad idea at the beginning level because you don't have very many tools in your tool chest to make things comprehensible. So like with the sign language thing, I have a little bit of background in sign language and that helped me much more than I realized, I think, because I got comments about that as well after, after the course went out. 
because well there, there are some hand signals that come naturally right so like house right it's it's you you make the 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 um, sloped roof with your hands and they pretty much anybody any anywhere realizes you're talking about a house you know, some some uh, signs in many sign languages are very similar for that reason because you're actually painting the picture with your hands and that's that's a nice little skill to have but again if you're not talking about something visual you can't do that <laughs> right <laughs> it's like question How, what's the sign for question it's different in in pretty much every sign language because it's um it's an abstract entity it's it's not something you can see mm -hmm. so um i think keeping things visual and easy to follow especially at the beginning level i think that for me that's the main takeaway um, but as you say you know if if you enjoy animals if you love if you love animals then i can see that you would have enjoyed the the first 20 stories yeah that's right. nice that's nice nice to nice nice to hear from you so yeah thank you very much is there anything you'd like to add before we wrap up no no i think that's it okay cool all right well if you're watching this or listening this then uh, thank you very much for being with us as well. If you're interested in uh, looking into Opiline Tokipona, this mysterious video course that tricks your brain into learning a language, then all you have to do is uh, go to Google or YouTube and search for OPETP, and it will be in the top results. And if you'd like to take this challenge and then be interviewed yourself afterwards, uh, visit bit.ly slash 30dcic. I'll be very happy to hear from you. So thanks, Raymond. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks again for making the series. It was great. Ah, thank you. Take care.